All right, welcome back to the Vendetta Sports Fantasy Show. Today is, I don't even know what today is. Today is Saturday, July 25th. We have Scott Logish and Jeremy in the house again. What's going on today, fellas? Not much. It's a pretty good day. All right, so uh, same crew as last time here. We're going to start off with topic number one here, which is our guy, Scott, landed an interview. Look at that. Tell us all about it. Give us the details. Yeah, so a while back, I sent a message on Twitter to Maximum Football, the development team behind Doug Flutie's Maximum Football 2020, kind of asking, hey, look, I write for this website, Medea Sports Media. I was wondering if I could get an interview with you guys about the game's development, the goal of the game, and any other topics you'd want to address. So after a bit of back and forth, I sent them an email with some questions. And then the other day, they got back to me. And first off, I'm really grateful for them for giving me the time of their day. They're busy in the development process to answer my questions. And I think it went well. It's a very small team of five developers. And they've developed this game that has a college football dynasty mode. And they made all of that from scratch. They're recruiting from scratch. 130 teams from scratch, and it's all customizable. You can essentially create your own team. You can take a team from there, and you can customize it however you want. You can change the colors, the logos, the name, just about anything. And this is a level of customization that we've been asking from EA. And this small company, this small Canadian company, is giving it to us. They're giving us the game we want. They're giving us a return to college football. They're giving us a game that we can customize. We can basically create our own league in the game. And all of their development has been community driven. I asked them the question, how has community feedback helped the process of developing the 2020 version of the game? And they said, all our development is driven by community feedback. We have a very active Discord server and Patreon program where our community provides us with feedback such as feature requests bug and bug reports to help guide our development. So they listen to us. They listen to the consumers. They feel that they are a part of the community. They said, we are all originally fans of football video games. So we feel like we're members of the community ourselves. And Maximum Football is truly a community-driven game. So we're always looking for ways to incorporate elements that our fans are seeking. They are giving us a platform. They're saying, look, we're making this game. What do you want in it? We'll add it. We'll do our best. We want to provide a game for you. And that's what I love about them. They're giving us a say in the game. They're looking at what we want. They're putting in the game. And that's what I love about them. Great job by Scott for getting the uh, interview. I'll be doing a YouTube series on it now. So we have that to look forward to. I think Scott will be doing something. Jeremy, you have anything to add? I just think that's awesome that we were able to get that interview. It's good work. Job well done by Scott. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, right, let's get into some uh, fantasy here. So in my league, we had two trades. So I think these are kind of fun to dive into because maybe you have a similar situation in your league. So Chad, who is on the site, acquired $50 Phillip Rivers to cap his $250 and acquired a first-round pick, rookie pick, for next year to take on the contract. He gives up Elijah Holyfield, who's a nothing. But Jeremy, Scott, what are your thoughts? Would you accept a Phillip Rivers who's $50? Do you think he's going to have a good year? Is it not worth it? What are your thoughts on that trade? Um, I wouldn't accept Phil Rivers for fifty dollars, especially because the cap's two fifty. So that's a decent amount of the portion going just to Rivers, who I think he's a backup quarterback at best for fantasy. He's he doesn't throw the ball as much as he used to. I should he's, clarify it is a two quarterback league, so maybe change something a little different. So go ahead. Yeah, maybe a little bit. Um, I still don't know if I would, just because I think. How many are there? Ten people in the league, or is it thirteen? Oh, uh, yeah. That I would, I would probably agree with that. Then, plus you're getting the rookie pick. I mean, if you need twenty six quarterbacks, yeah, Rivers is definitely one of the twenty six that should be with a roster spot. I don't think he's as good as he was, and I don't think he's going to throw the ball as much as he was. But he still has some weapons in Indy. So I mean, he's a He's a lower quarterback, especially in the 26. I'd put him at around like 19 or 18 or some somewhere around there. But if you're getting a 
starter for fantasy and you're getting a rookie second round pick who you can likely turn that player into a starter too. I think that that's worth it then. Scott? My one question, how long is Rivers' contract? It's just this year. Just this one year. I would absolutely take that deal because, one, it's a two-quarterback lead league. Rivers is definitely one of the best 20 quarterbacks in the NFL, and you're getting a first-round pick. You only have to eat the money for one year. Rivers has the potential to be very productive in Indianapolis, especially with that amazing offensive line that they have. And you're just getting that first-round pick. Like, that first-round pick is what really makes this deal a good deal, and that Rivers is – He's only going to eat up that much money of the cap. Only he's going to eat up fifty dollars of a two hundred and fifty cap for one year. I would absolutely take that trade. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I would have taken the trade too, especially in Chad's position where he's not necessarily a super super contender to win it. You could collect a first round rookie pick and quarterback prices in this league. You know, when everybody needs at least two and all of them go down at some point, you kind of need three or four. I kind of agree. I would take the trade too, especially in Chad's position. All right. And then I made a trade. Scott has been, uh, I've gotten a little annoyed with Scott, but I knew, <laughs> I knew this was going to happen anyway. I traded away Aaron Jones, who was phenomenal last year for Josh Allen and a second round rookie pick. Scott, let's go to you first. What do you think of my trade? I absolutely love it. Like, you're getting Josh Allen, who is a phenomenal fantasy quarterback. His rushing production alone puts him in at least a top 10 fantasy potential. You're getting a second-round rookie pick. I'm not entirely – how many rounds are there in your draft? It's just two. It's just two, okay. So you're still getting a valuable pick. And Aaron Jones, I just don't think he's going to be able to replicate exactly what he did in 2019. Because with A.J. Dillon, he's going to be a touchdown vulture. He's going to be stealing those goal line carries, and that's automatically going to just drop Aaron Jones' fantasy production. And you sold him high. You got a great quarterback and a pick. I love this trade. Let's go to Jeremy. I should add in that for this year, Aaron Jones is $9 expiring contract, and Josh Allen is $4 expiring contract. So the money's kind of even. Yeah, I'm going to agree that it was a good trade for you for a lot of the reasons that Scott had said, like Josh Allen – He's a dual threat quarterback. He gets a lot of rushing yards. He gets a lot of rushing touchdowns for you. And he, th and he can throw the ball. He's got, he's got weapons this year. Stefan Diggs joined. They, um, they drafted a couple receivers late on uh, Dawson Knox, their tight end who I like all those guys and John Brown, who's a deep threat. He's got a lot of options and you know, the same concerns with Aaron Jones. I mean, last year he was obviously the better running back than uh, Williams, but they were splitting um possessions so one of them would have the possession and the other would have the next and if you're throwing an AJ Dillon to the mix there's just so much uncertainty around how they're going to run with those three running backs so I think the safe bet would be get Josh Allen get that rookie pick which I mean you could turn it into a running back too and you never know how that yeah, one work I was worried about AJ Dillon maybe it won't be such a big deal but I was worried about it and I like to stockpile quarterbacks, so now I have Tua, Dwayne Haskins, and Josh Allen before the draft, so I could feel pretty good about that position. Yeah. I mean, if it was like a fourth-round pick or, you know, a day three late-round pick, it would be a different story. But the fact that they took Dylan in the second round says that we're going to use him. Even if it's scarce, they're going to still – he's going to be involved in the offense, like Scott said, definitely at the goal line. A.J. Dillon's going to be involved, so – all right, let's get into the fantasy show here. We are brought to you by VendettaSportsMedia.com. I am Trey Dalbert, exactly how it sounds on Twitter. Slogish52 for Scott. And Jeremy, I forget your Twitter handle. What is it again? JRinaldi2. There we go. JRinaldi2. Let's get into the topics here. We are talking – oh, wait. What was the first topic here? Let me pull this Fantasy up. horror story. There we go. Yeah. Fantasy horror story. Bad trade, bad draft pick. Bad waiver wire pick, bad starting lineup decision. Scott, let's go to you here. Do you have a bad horror story for fantasy? So in 2018, I have two. So in 2018, I was in two fantasy leagues, and I saw Le'Veon Bell go number one overall in both. That was the year he held out the entire season. That's a wasted number one overall pick, and they were fuming mad. And then another one is, you remember Derrick Henry's monster week? 
in week 14 of 2018 against the Jaguars? I believe that's before he really got going, right? I know. That's what I mean. <laughs> it's before he really got going. And my friend essentially got single-handedly beat by Derrick Henry that week. And we were, sit- we were sitting around having lunch. This was the Friday after that Thursday night game. I, yeah, I think it was a Thursday night game where he knew Thursday it was over. Game. <laughs> yeah. He goes on his computer. He's like, what the fuck is this? And I'm just sitting there laughing. He's like, what? Who the fuck? What? It was just fucking hilarious. And he had he that 99-yard touchdown. Yeah. Four <laughs> touchdowns, 238 rushing yards. That week was done after Thursday. Jeremy? So I took Le'Veon Bell that year that Scott was talking about as well. Uh-huh. But that's actually – that's not my horror story. So mine comes back from 2012. I was – I was 10, so I was in a league with my dad. We were in the championship week. Uh, we were debating on who to start for wide receiver. We ended up benching Jordy Nelson, and it was the Packers against the Lions. We benched Jordy Nelson because Matt Flynn was starting quarterback and not Aaron Rodgers, and they were saving it for the playoffs. And I don't know if you guys remember, but in that game, Matt Flynn completed 31 of 44 pass attempts for 480 yards and six touchdowns. That's the year he got the contract, right? From Seattle. I think he, I think he got it the next year, yeah. <laughs> Jordy Nelson in that game, nine receptions, 162 yards, three touchdowns. I think in my – I don't remember the exact amount of points, but I think it was around 50. And he was on my bench in the championship game, so that's how we lost. Yeah, I'll just use mine from last year because I'm still not over it. I was the best team all year. I led the league in points by a mile in the fantasy championship. Deshaun Watson decides to have zero touchdowns against the Buccaneers of all team. And uh, at wide receiver, this is what really got me. I started Will Fuller over Robbie Anderson, and Will Fuller left in the first quarter, and Robbie Anderson had a touchdown, and I would have won. And I'm still not over it. Yikes. Yeah. I only had to start one of them, too, because Chris Godwin decided he wanted to get hurt at the end of the year. Oh, fun. Oh, yeah, that's right. That was when um, Brashad Perry. Fun. Yeah, yeah. It was great. All right. Let's get into the main focus here, which is bounce back wide receivers. So this will be player that maybe had it down 2019 season, but you project will have a strong 2020 season. Maybe you can get them at a value this year. Jeremy, who is your pick number one here? So I'm going to start out with Golden Tate. He's on the Giants now. And I think he's going to be a bounce back just because it's the second year with Daniel Jones. The chemistry should be better. They bolstered the offensive line a little bit in the off season. So Jones should have more time to throw and he should start to progress and, you know, make better decisions as a quarterback. So Golden Tate was targeted at least five times in 10 of his 11 games. So that's a lot of volume he was getting. Uh, there was three games where he was targeted over 10 times. Um, he's a threat in multiple ways. He catches a lot of screen passes. He runs a lot of slants, which are, you know, quarterback's best friend. And he's, he gets himself open on the deep routes. Um, He was getting high volume last season, but uh, it was mostly Daniel Jones not being able to convert those looks. So I think with improved quarterback play, which I think Daniel Jones will have a better year. I think that Golden Tate's a prime candidate for a bounce back year. And I think he'll be the number one option in New York. I don't hate that pick because there's a lot of things going for him. It's going to be a pass-happy offense because they're going to be trailing. Daniel Jones should be better, and Golden Tate was suspended last year. So he missed how many games and then actually performed okay when he got into the lineup. Scott, anything? I like this pick because on the Giants, we're still not sure what their receiving core is going to look like. And also – Golden Tate's going to be returning back. You Like you mentioned, he was suspended, and when he came back from that suspension, he played pretty well. So I can definitely see him being a solid fantasy wide receiver. Go ahead, Scott. Give your pick. My first pick is Marquise Brown, wide receiver for the Ravens. And this is because he's going to be healthy this year. Last year, we were taught, he said he could hardly walk. He had an injured foot. I think he maybe had a screw in his foot. I don't remember entirely. But he also has the speed to make big plays. He had four catches for 147 yards and two touchdowns in a game last year. He has the speed to make plays. And also, he's the only real wide receiver in Baltimore right now. 
Like no one else on that receipt in that receiving core is appealing to me. You can talk about the tight ends, but ultimately you're going to need a wide receiver to beat man coverage on the outside. And Marquise Brown can do it. Baltimore has definitely built their offense to where Marquise Brown should succeed. He's the deep threat. And with Lamar Jackson, he kind of spreads the whole field around. So I could see that him have, if he has four long touchdowns all year, he's going to be good. And if he gets, what, 80 receptions, 900 yards, six touchdowns, I think he could have a really good season. I think that's realistic. Yeah, I agree. Just because, I mean, the fact they took him, I think, with the 25th pick two years or two years ago in the draft. So he's going to be a, like a focal point in their offense. The running backs, it's going to be a committee. So you don't really know how those touches are going to add up. But Marquise Brown's probably the best option um, for the wide receivers in Baltimore. I mean, obviously, other than Mark Andrews at tight end, who's we know is a reliable pick. Yeah, um, it's, Will, it's Willie Sneed, Devin Duvernay, and James yeah, exactly. Crochet, I guess. So Brown should be the number one. Yeah. I'm going to give my pick here, and it's kind of a weird pick, but I'm going to go Cortland Sutton. Now, he had a pretty good year, actually. Over 1,100 yards, six touchdowns. But he wasn't very good with Drew Locke, is my point here. Week 17 against Denver, 52 yards. Or my bad, against Oakland, 52 yards. Week before that against the Lions, 41 yards. Week before that against Kansas City, 79 yards. Week before that against Houston, 34 yards. No touchdowns. He was basically unplayable, even though he had a really good year. He was just bad when Drew Locke was the quarterback somehow. I think that changes. You bring in a Jerry Judy. He's not going to get doubled the whole time. We've, we've said this about Juju Smith-Schuster. One of the worst things that happened to him was Antonio Brown leaving the field. Cortland Sutton was the only guy there last year, and I think it really hurt him because defenses, all they did was focus on him. Drew Locke, I think, is going to be better this year heading into year two. Denver is going to be a real team. So I think the people that panicked a little bit, Cortland Sutton had a bad half of the second year – or bad second half of the year. I think he's back to normal, has a good year, and Jerry Judy helps a lot. Absolutely. The addition of Jerry Judy is going to immediately take attention away from Cortland Sutton, and he's going to have an offseason with Drew Locke. He's going to have an offseason to understand what he likes to do, what Drew Locke likes to see in routes, what Drew Locke thinks is open, and what Drew Locke is going to take a shot on. And when you build that chemistry, it's going to help. Because last offseason, Joe Flacco was designed to be the starting quarterback. So there wasn't a ton of practice with Drew Locke. And he got hurt in the preseason. Like He wasn't on the active roster for a solid chunk of the year. It was only until late in the season where he actually started practicing and started getting reps with Cortland Sun. You give them an offseason, that chemistry is going to improve. And Cortland Sun is going to bounce back with Drew Locke. Yeah, I definitely agree. I'm I'm really high on the, on the Broncos coming into this year. Cortland Sutton's definitely going to be one of the guys that I target in my draft. Um, I think the addition of Jerry Judy really helps. And just the fact that they had gotten rid of Emmanuel Sanders early last year just shows that they're committed to Cortland Sutton as their number one, number two target, depending on how Jerry Judy and um, KJ Hamler are. So I think that's definitely a really good pick. Go ahead, Jeremy. Give your second pick here. So my second one's a bit of a weird one, too. I'm going with Michael Gallup um, for Dallas. I think the addition with C.D. Lamb, most people are going to pick C.D. Lamb higher than Gallup. So I think Gallup's going to slip far. And I'm not saying, like, he's going to be a great fantasy receiver, but I think I I would pick him as a bounce back just because he's going to slide down boards because of the addition of C.D. Lamb. He had 1,107 um, yards last year, which was 20th in the NFL. So I think people forget how good Michael Gallup really is. I think with, you know, two other weapons that teams are going to have to focus on, they're going to have to focus on Amari Cooper and C.D. Lamb. Uh, if Gallup, especially if Gallup plays the slot, I think Gallup's going to have a big year. I mean, we've seen teams with three pass catching weapons have all three of them have good fantasy seasons. And I think this could be no different. I think Gallup could end up having the best of the three years, especially because I'm not as high in Amari Cooper just because he's a boomer bust each game almost. 
And Gallup, I think, is more of a steady game-by-game -game receiver. And, he, I mean, he averaged 16.8 yards per catch last year, which was seventh in the league. So that's big for a fantasy standpoint as well. I think if he could just improve on, you know, the touchdowns, he only had six last year. If he can get that number up into 10, he could, be a, he could have a monster season. I'm on your side here. We've talked about this in a previous episode, but is Amari Cooper going to suffer? Is CeeDee Lamb going to suffer? Or is Michael Gallup going to suffer? I don't think the answer is really Michael Gallup. I think him and Cooper could be on a similar tier in terms of yards, receptions, touchdowns, or whatever. And Mike McCarthy in the past, he's had Jordy Nelson, James Jones, and Randall Cobb on the field, and Greg Jennings. He's supported all those guys in the past. My biggest concern is, and you can speak to this, is Dak Prescott going to throw for 5,000 yards again? Because that's the one I'm nervous about. Does he take a little bit of a step back? Um, I don't know if he's going to take a step back. I don't think he's going to throw for 5,000 yards either, though. I think it's going to be um, in between. I think he'll have a like one of his usual seasons. I just think Gallup, now that he's entering his, um, I believe, third year in the league, I think he's going to be – a focal point now that they saw, I mean, he was seventh in yards per catch, 20th in yards. So they, they know he's really talented. And I think part of it is because again, a lot of people are thrown off by the addition of CD lamb, but the Cowboys weren't going for CD lamb. They, he just fell in their lap at 17 and they just jumped on him. They weren't planning on picking him. So I don't think that changes anything with their offense. What you're talking about before, I actually think Cooper is going to be the one to suffer just because he's still going to be the one that gets covered by that number one corner, you know, um, Philly added Darius Slay. So Darius Slay is a really good cornerback who's going to be on Cooper. And so I think that might free up some targets for both C.D. Lamb and Michael Gallup. But I'd put my money on Gallup before I put it on Lamb. I loved the uh, talent of Gallup, too, coming out of the draft. I think he's just been underrated just because he went to Colorado State, too. He was a great route runner in college. Scott, what is your opinion here on Gallup? I like the pick, but I'm also agreeing with you, Trey, in that we can see Dak Prescott take a major step back. Like, this year, in terms of production, has been a massive outlier when you compare it to the rest of his career. And Kellen Moore is still there. That offensive system still there. But you do have Mike McCarthy, and he's going to want to run things his way. And so I don't see Dak throwing for as many yards again. I just don't see him being able to repeat that. 5,000 yards is a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, Especially when you got Zeke and he's getting his touches. Exactly. Scott, give your second pick here. Randall Cobb, wide receiver for the Houston Texans. And I have one question for you guys. Do you know how many receiving yards he had last year? He actually had a quiet good year somehow. I know. It was He had probably the quietest 800 receiving yards I have ever seen. And he's going to be stepping into a team that they have big shoes to fill in DeAndre Hopkins. He's the third wide receiver from the get-go. But you also have Will Fuller and Brandon Cooks, and those guys have been known to get hurt a lot. Randall Cobb can sneak his way into that number one role just by virtue of injuries. Now, Scott, let me ask you this, though, because my biggest question here would be there's a lot of mouths to feed here. I think Brandon Cooks and Will Fuller are both more talented, and I think Kenny Stills has his role where he's the deep guy. So you, now we're talking Randall Cobb's four. Now they paid him a decent amount of money in the off season, but are we really going out of our way to draft Randall Cobb or are we like, eh, maybe he's a waiver wire guy or what are we doing there? Randall Cobb is going to be the guy who works the slot. When you're replacing a big receiver like DeAndre Hawkins, who is a guy you can just say, fuck it, throw it. He's open. He'll make the contested catch. You have to move away from that if you're Deshaun Watson. You have to move away from just throwing jump balls to DeAndre Hopkins because he's not there. It's like Matthew Stafford when Calvin Johnson left. He had to change. He can't just say, fuck it, throw it up to Calvin Johnson anymore because he's gone. He's got to start looking through the progressions and see who's really open. Randall Cobb's going to work the slot. He's going to work the middle of the field, the short intermediate, intermediate routes for sure. I think Deshaun Watson takes a huge step forward in that regard of being able to process defenses and more throwing to the open guy who's actually open instead of throwing DeAndre Hopkins open, which is he's smothered, but he can make the contested catch. Jeremy, anything on Cobb here? Uh, I definitely see the potential because I remember, I believe it was two years ago, 
Kiki Kuti, he had a couple of good weeks when Will Fuller was injured. So I think the only thing is I feel like you might be banking on, you know, Fuller and Cooks to get hurt. I mean, which is definitely, I mean, they've proven that they've gotten hurt a lot in the past. So that's why I'd be weary to draft them. And so that's why I think if anyone's a breakout candidate for the Texans, that it is um, Randall Cobb. So I definitely see the potential. All right, I'll give my last pick here, and that is Deshaun Jackson. Deshaun Jackson barely played last year, but I think he still has it. Last year in week one, he absolutely blew up the Redskins. He was the number one wide receiver in fantasy week one last year against Washington. And I'm sure a lot of people had him and just didn't play him, but I think Deshaun Jackson still has it. The guy just needs to be on the field. They, Doug Peterson has talked about Jalen Rager and how he's going to fit into the offense. His exact quote is, we want him to learn from Deshaun. I don't think Jalen Rager is going to see the field as much as we think he is. And Alshon Jeffrey, he looks like a deer that got shot. I don't, I think he might be on the pup list to start the year. Jackson's going to be there. Carson Wentz has shown he likes throwing him the football. I think Jackson could be a sneaky guy that he saves you a couple weeks. He has two long touchdowns. Maybe he's not consistent, but He's the guy I'd take in a draft and just let's see it. You know, I'm throwing him in as my last flex spot. We'll see what happens. I like this pick because Deshaun Jackson is still an absolute burner, despite him being in his early to mid thirties. And Carson Wentz has shown he's got a great arm. He wants to throw the deep ball. The issue is when Jackson got hurt, he couldn't. Because no one else on that offense had that type of speed, had that type of speed to just take the top off a of defense and just long bomb touchdown. If Deshaun Jackson stays healthy, he's going to be a great fantasy wide receiver. I love this pick. Yeah, I definitely agree. If he gets off to a hot start like he did last year, and if he you know stays healthy, my only question would be, like you said with the quote that Rager's going to learn from Jackson. If Jackson, you know, doesn't play great, is Rager going to take over, you know, in week three as, like, that deep threat? I'm almost more worried about Marquise Goodwin because, I don't know, did you trade for him for no reason? And I know Philadelphia needs weapons. But to me, what if Marquise Goodwin's actually the deep ball guy and they kind of phased Deshaun Jackson out? That would be my concern. That's true, yeah. It's absolutely a concern because Marquis Gruen has great speed. He's also younger than Deshaun Jackson. And again, Deshaun Jackson has shown that he can get hurt. And so that's definitely one thing to look out for. But Deshaun Jackson stays healthy. He's been in that offense. He has familiarity with it. He has a rapport with Carson Wentz that we saw last year. Deshaun Jackson's still going to produce. Let me ask you this before we go to our last segment here. Who's the most talented wide receiver in Philadelphia? Because I think it's Deshaun Jackson. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Jeremy? Yeah, I would probably have to say <laughs> – you really can't say Jeffrey. Yeah, exactly. All right, it's time. Who the fuck is that guy? I got to play Who the fuck is that guy? All right. Scott's favorite segment. He does the articles on VendettaSportsMedia.com. Who the fuck is that guy? Guy you never heard of. Guy you never draft. Somehow, some way, he will be a hero and win you your fantasy league. Jeremy, let's go to you. Who is your pick for this week? Yeah, I love this segment, too, because I'm a big draft guy. <laughs> I'm going to go with Hakeem Butler, wide receiver, Arizona. He was a fourth-round pick out of Iowa State in last year's draft. So, if you don't know who he is, that's because he was – on the I, he was placed on the IR in the preseason last year. Didn't play a snap. I was very high on him in the draft process. I think he's really talented, and I think Arizona's a really good fit for him. There's not that many weapons over there, and the fact that they didn't take a receiver early just made me like uh, where Hakeem Butler's at even more. You know, they took guys like Andy Isabella over him, and I mean, he's just a slot guy from UMass. He's a short receiver who he doesn't have much of a role. Hakeem Butler is a tall receiver who can run the field. I don't remember his 40 time, but I'm, I, I think he ran around a four or five, which is still a pretty good time. 
And he's like six um, six or something. Yeah, he's a big guy. Fitzgerald's getting older. Christian Kirk's Christian Kirk's not bad. And Kyler Murray really wants to throw the ball. And if Hakeem I just hope he stays healthy come week one. I think he's a guy who can have a really big season. He's a guy who can, you know, be talked about as like the waiver wire pick of the year. He didn't have a lot of drops in Iowa State. He has a good route tree. He's quick on his feet for a guy his size. He, I think he's a threat in um, all areas, all throughout the field. So I was really high on him, really liked him going to Arizona. So I think this could be a big year for him. I like that pick just because there's a chance he could be a big red zone target too. And yeah. after I do actually trust Christian Kirk, I don't really trust anybody else. I didn't like Andy Isabella coming out of that draft process. Yeah, I thought they took him way too early just because, I mean, I guess he had a good senior bowl. Gruden put the Raiders sticker on his helmet, so I guess he had a good senior bowl. Other than that, like, I wasn't very high on him. I think Christian Kirk's a good receiver, too, and I think he'll probably enter as the number one, and you know Larry Fitzgerald's going to be on the field. And Hopkins. But, yeah, and Hopkins. Oh, yeah, that's right. Hopkins will be the one. And then um, Kirk will be on the field as well as Fitzgerald. Well, if you're going for a deep sleeper, I really like Akeem Butler in that offense. Scott? One thing is, like, did we just forget DeAndre Hawkins exists? <laughs> like, Butler will see the field maybe in four receiver sets, which – Which they do run a lot. They though. will that, run a lot yeah. because that style of offense is a very college air raid style of offense, which is just line them up, spread them out, throw it deep. So in those four receiver sets, I can definitely see it. Exactly. And, and what I was talking about earlier with, you know, Kiki Cootie had a couple big weeks for Houston. You know, DeAndre Hopkins was there. I think it could be this, more of the same for Hakeem Butler, especially because you we don't know how much Larry Fitzgerald's going to be in the offense. We don't like this is I mean, we say this every year, but this is probably his last year. So we don't know how much he's going to be in the offense. And their their tight ends aren't great. And Hakeem Butler just he does a lot of things. That I think he could he could be on the field for them a lot. All right, Scott, what do you have? Buddy Howell. That's not a real person. Yes, it is. Buddy Howell. Buddy Howell. That's not a real guy. That is a real guy. He's a running back for the Houston Texans. He played college football at Florida Atlantic. Huh. He, he is he is a real guy. Okay, go ahead. So he's currently listed as the third running back on the depth chart. A 6'1", 218. David Johnson, who the hell knows what we may be getting with him. And as it goes to Duke Johnson, the other running back ahead of him, Duke Johnson had as many receiving yards as rushing yards. He's going to be the receiving back. Buddy Howell, and yes, it's a real name. It's a fun name. It's a great name. He's going to be the the between-the-tackle runner. On the goal line, they're going to give it to him to plow through the offensive line to score a few touchdowns. He is a real shot to become the number one running back for the Houston Texans, especially since David Johnson has been so bad the last couple of years. He had that one amazing year, and then he's been terrible ever since. Buddy Howell is younger and has more potential. (laughs) That's a good one. Jeremy, did you know who that was? I did not. (laughs) All right, good pick, Scott. I love it. My pick is going to be Levante Bellamy played at Western Michigan. He's in Denver right now, which is kind of a crowded backfield, but Melvin Gordon, Royce Freeman, Philip Lindsay, maybe there's an injury or two there. Levante Bellamy is a really fast guy. I believe he had the fastest 40 time of all the running backs at the combine. I didn't really love his vision. I watched a couple of Mac games, but it looks like he's more of a speed guy than a pure actually knows what he's doing running back. But I think there's maybe a chance he can develop into one. So Denver took him. I think maybe there's a chance. Who knows? And I I actually like the Broncos this year. I think they're going to be a lot better than they were last year. Absolutely, the Broncos are going to be better. Simply because they are loading up their offense to try and go toe-to-toe with the Chiefs. Yeah, I, I like the Broncos too this year. You know, we talked about it earlier. Um, I liked Bellamy during the draft process. I I believe he went undrafted, right? I think I, so. I think I I had him as like a late sixth or seventh round pick. 
I just don't know about if he's even going to be able to get any touches just because undrafted free agents are going to have it really tough this year with likely no preseason games, the training camp improvised. So it's just a question of if he's going to be able to see touches in that backfield. Any closing thoughts here? Check out the store. Check out the store. Buy a shirt if you can. Uh, Some of the writers will be getting, obviously, free shirts. So that'll be going on on Instagram. Make sure to uh, rep the products here. Anyway, uh, make sure to follow Jay Rinaldi. What's the number? Two. Jay Rinaldi, two. S. Logish, 52. And myself, Trey Dalbert. Follow the site and uh, hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Until next time, we'll see you soon.